Welcome to Variations 4, uh, the immune system units, uh, HIV, AIDS specific topic. In this video, we'll be covering questions 9 through to 14. And uh, just starting with number 10, because it's kind of more of an in-class question, uh, where students will debate the pros and cons of mandatory public health um, HIV testing. So that, it, so that is, if a patient comes to a hospital, should it be mandatory for them to have HIV testing? And you know, we've often heard really good arguments on both sides. It's an interesting discussion. Um, we've had students share with us that some of the students from the countries they come, they come from, it is mandatory and is working. And of course, many come from our country now who are here now, and it is not mandatory. And there's really um, pros and cons for both, and it always ends up being a really fruitful discussion, but we'll kind of leave that um, at that for now. Um, review the considerations around ARV drugs, and I think that's map five, and I think we'll tie in. Um, um, I think, yeah, we'll just, we'll just kind of go on map five for that one. Uh, it is interesting to note that antiretroviral drugs, ARVs, can cause a lowering in um, healthy cells like neutrophils, platelets, and red blood cells. So that'd be something to monitor. Uh, the goals of ARV therapy is obviously to what? Decrease viral load, decrease viral levels. And in many HIV patients these days, the viral levels are undetectable, um, which is amazing. And then thereby, if you are able to decrease viral levels, what does, that, what does that allow CD4 count to do? It allows CD4 count to climb back up and then the patient has a really strong immune system. And these days we see a lot of HIV people living to a ripe old age. Um, rewind 15, 20 years ago when ARVs either weren't as advanced, we didn't know as much about them, or even more so compliance rate was not very high. Um, understanding of things was not very high. We would have a lot of patients on specific wards in the hospital with, you know, end stage AIDS, like terminal patients with AIDS, really, really sick with AIDS. We don't even have that ward anymore at the hospital because now with the ARVs today and the compliance rate, at least in you know British Columbia, we're not seeing many cases of AIDS because these ARVs work well. I mean, they're not without their side effects, but they have a very beneficial effect on the viral load and CD4 count. So viral load goes down, CD4 counts go up, patient ends up with a very strong immune system, doesn't end up getting the opportunistic infections associated with AIDS. So at the time that this presentation was put together, the combination of ARVs was three or more from at least two classes of ARVs. So in hospital, you'll actually be giving you know, three capsules or more, so to speak, from at least two classes of ARVs. The reason why the kind of mixing them up is, first of all, they attack the HIV um, replication process at different stages. So that's one reason in terms of the two classes. You also mix them up because um, uh, HIV is pretty smart. If you only use one ARV, it would become resistant to it. So it decreases resistance. But obviously these people who are on ARVs have to get tested for blood count, as we talked about up here, CBCs, they also need to get tested for um, viral load and CD4 counts to see where things are at. How are they doing? CD4 count probably being the main thing. So we've kind of already moved into question 11 here already. And then the second part of question 11 is asking, when do we recommend starting ARVs? Um, at the time this presentation was put together, it was, um, now, first of all, it's variable, it's patient specific, but generally speaking, um, you know, if you're symptomatic, sure, um, it says, you know, symptomatic HIV disease, or if you're asymptomatic, um, basically, uh, when you get below 350, uh, less than 350, so that's approaching that, remember that 200 mark towards AIDS, 350 or less, it's recommended you start. Um, um, ARVs, um, it, and you can start them if they are, you know, at a higher CD4 count too. But if it starts getting less than 350, it's strongly recommended. Um, you know, if it's greater than 350, it's really an individual discussion with with your physician. Many harsh side effects, as I noticed, uh, as I had mentioned before.
the, the regime is challenging, can be challenging because of the side effects. So I'll outline the main teaching points from map number seven. Pretty straightforward stuff. I mean, if you're talking to a group of high school students, what would you tell them? I and mean, probably these three things here. What's the nature of the disease? How do you prevent transmission? And the importance of testing and protecting other people if you've engaged in risky behavior. Those would be probably three major points you'd want to teach students who are learning about this for the first time. Um, if, the other thing is that someone just got diagnosed with HIV, um, they're going to need some grief counseling, uh, most likely just to kind of um, come to terms with things. Um, there's going to be psychosocial issues. They would need much of the same teaching as you'd give the students above, but they're going to take more time to take it in because now they've been told they're positive, and that can be a pretty dramatic uh, event for many people, obviously. All right, and I believe the final question here has to do with needle stick injuries. Needle stick injury, uh, I mean, I've scribbled down some notes here in your, um, in your uh, maps here. Um, what do you do if you have a needle stick injury? This is not just for HIV patients. Anytime you have a needle stick injury, um, what you want to do right away is wash, wash with soap and water. You do want to do that. You don't want to squeeze, heavily squeeze on the wound, uh, the puncture wound, because that can actually cause more damage to tissue and increase the spread of the, if there is a path, if there is a, um, a pathogen there, can increase its spread to the system, systemic blood flow. So you don't want to squeeze, like sque try and squeeze anything out. That won't work and it will cause more damage. Just wash with soap and water. You need to report to security or whatever the protocol is to the CNL, charge nurse, security right away. You basically need to get down to a merge right away and they need to do the appropriate tests on you and the patient to figure out where to go from here. Do you need ARVs? Do you need interferon? Was the guy hep C? Where are we at? So we need to get to a merge. You need to get tested. The patient needs to get tested. Um, all that kind of stuff needs to happen as quick as possible. And you need to go home. You cannot stay on shift. Um, uh, because no matter what you think, I can tell you right now, you will be very distracted for the rest of your shift and you'll be a, a danger. Um, the good news is uh, if you're just giving an injection um, and you, then you get a stick afterwards, needle stick afterwards, very, very low chance that anything serious like HIV or hep C will be transmitted that way. It's a very, very low chance. On the other hand, if you're drawing blood out of someone, and you stick yourself with it, or trying to insert an IV and there's blood in the needle, you know, from the flashback and you accidentally poke yourself and get some of the blood in your system that way. Oh, well then the chances, which is not something that currently is in PN scope, but if that did happen to you, there'd be a much higher chance of transmission that way. Okay. And the last question on the uh, questions uh, in class questions here, the last one, um, number 14, I believe it was. That's just asking you to go through the Moodle exercises and the answers are all right there for you. Um, if you just kind of head on down to uh, the immune system and you have your HIV matching questions here. I just can get my mouse back there. And, um, and then you've got the HIV matching questions key. You just go through that yourself. Um, I would say that the main ones you wanna be uh, looking at would be, uh, I mean, you should be able to recognize any of these in an exam. It's just basic recall here. But the ones that really kind of stand out um, are uh, that you, Kaposi's sarcoma, candidia, yeah, candidiasis, otherwise known as thrush. Um, I mean, these are all pretty easy to remember based on the keywords, but those are the two big ones. They're two of the early signs of HIV. And we saw, in fact, oh, sorry, of HIV turning to AIDS. And we saw a lot of that in the 80s um, uh, when uh, this phenomenon was taking off and, and no one really knew what this new thing was called HIV. Uh, we saw a lot of um, this, uh, I've got pictures here in your PowerPoint, um, right here. Let's get this back to here. This is Kaposi's sarcoma. 
it's got those all over your body. And then this is the thrush, which of course you've seen thrush before for people who've taken um, any kind of um, oral corticosteroid, like an inhaler. If we don't rinse with water afterwards, they can get thrush too. Thrush too. So you've probably seen this before, but um, it's also an early opportunistic infection that may signal AIDS <laughs> for someone with the, the right background, the right history, Kapo Kaposi sarcoma.